Justin Webb is a British journalist who's worked for the BBC since 1984. He is a former BBC North American editor and the made co-presenter on the BBC One Breakfast News programme. Since August 2009, he has co-presented the Today's programme on BBC Radio 4 and also regularly writes for the Radio Times. Hi. Hello. So, why did you choose journalism <laughs> as a career? Were you always interested in writing and reporting? I was, actually. I had absolutely no... Uh, uh, question in my mind by the time I was sort of 16 or so that it's what I wanted to do and that's partly actually because I couldn't do anything else uh, I was no good at maths, I was no good at science in my day uh, I didn't even take a science O level GCSE, not a single one uh, it was possible when I was young just to give things up, awful really um, but I had, so I had no breadth of education, there was, there was only one thing that I could do and that was write and I was actually quite good at writing quite early in as much as I could string things together really quickly. I found that I could write quickly and I liked doing it. And I also wanted to have a more adventurous life than my parents had had. I didn't want to work in an office. I knew at sort of 16 or so that I, I, I wanted to be out there talking to people. I wanted to get on planes. I wanted to sort of see things. So those two things kind of came together and I realised then, certainly by the time I left school, that there wasn't really anything else I could do, actually. What was it like going straight from university to Northern Ireland at a time of mm. political unrest? It was fabulous, actually. I went because, um, because of the unrest. Um, and that, of course, as a journalist, uh, you, you want to go where there is conflict, where there are things happening. Um, uh, and you want to have the experience early on in your career of kind of running fast when people throw stones or worse, uh, of, of seeing um, uh, real conflict um, uh, at a, at a, at a, at a close-up um, stage where you can actually gauge, you can begin to gauge, um, and this is a very interesting thing about Northern Ireland, you can gauge when people are just arguing or when they're liable to fight as well and when you might need to, to withdraw. So there was a real sort of sense of, in a practical way actually, particularly if you want to be a war reporter, um, uh, ca coming in a relatively safe environment, as it was for an Englishman actually going to Northern Ireland, because you're not part of the, of the conflict, in a relatively safe environment, being able to see what it was like to be covering that sort of thing. So that's why I went, and it, and it, uh, it was fun to do. But then, of course, once you arrive, you also begin, and this is part of journalism too, to become quite engaged by what's happening and to like people and to feel sorry, actually, that they are in this awful situation and to hope that things can be done to, to make it better. And then that makes you a kind of more rounded person. Um, uh, and that, I, I found that also um, and a really important part of the Northern Ireland experience was as a young person, <clears throat> to be honest, without a lot of kind of sympathy for the outside world, to begin to, to understand that <clears throat> there was more to life than just covering conflict, that actually these were real people whose real lives were being desperately badly affected in some way. So th th you, you, it, it kind of engages you on all levels. And I really, I, 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 that year and a half I spent in Northern Ireland, I look back on with enormous affection. And I made a lot of friends there. And I, I really, um, really developed an interest in the place, not just as a, as a place to practice a career, but also as a place that was, was important. You've reported from war zones, including the first mm. Gulf War, the Bosnian War, <clears> and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Have you ever feared that your life was in danger? Oh yeah, yeah, quite a few times. Um, I remember in Bosnia being in a hotel where there'd been a lot of shooting uh, outside the hotel during the night, so we slept in the corridors, in the inside corridors. The rooms had the views, obviously, uh, and the inside corridors had, had no windows. So I remember sleeping in a, in a bath in one of the inside bathrooms because that's the safest thing because baths, shrapnel and stuff just ping off a bath unless it comes into the top. So, um, uh, and then getting up in the morning and making, and, and thinking we'll go into the room and make a cup of tea uh, and bring it out for the cameraman and the, and the sound recorders. So I went into the room because the shooting had died down a bit and I remember going into the corner of the room making a cup of tea, you sort of do it really slowly checking it all, the, the tea bag, putting the tea bag out, getting the cup, walking very slowly to the door. Um, I think I even had to put one cup down to open the door, open the door, put it down. And, and the second that I closed the door behind me, a mortar shell landed on the balcony 
and blew up the entire room. And the entire room was just eviscerated. It was covered in shrapnel, everything destroyed. I mean, we, we were sort of all knocked over in the, in the corridor. And the cameraman then kicked open the door and filmed it. And the whole room had been ripped to bits. And, you know, if I had been, I mean, in my memory, it's very difficult to remember these things exactly as they are, but I, I, it seemed to me that it was like three or four seconds between me closing the door and walking out of the door mm -hmm. and, and the thing happening. And those sorts of things, you, you actually you do get quite used to, but at the same time, I think they have a cumulative effect. And I stopped being a war reporter about halfway through my career, and I'm quite glad that I did, because I think it, it does have an effect on you. And you don't, it's not that you get used to it, Mm -hmm. It's that you think you've got used to it, but something's happened in your head that probably isn't a very good thing for it. So I don't necessarily recommend an entire lifetime of doing it, though I do recommend, I think if you're physically courageous enough and you like excitement, um, it's an amazing thing to do for a, for a little bit. If you um, like living on the edge. If you like living <laughs> on the edge, yeah, yeah, which some people do. And I, you know, I, there are people, I was, I was in the first Gulf War as well, which was... You didn't have experiences like that, but you did feel constantly rather frightened because they were going to use uh, chemical weapons. This was back in 19... When was the first Gulf War? 91 or so. And, and, and there was a threat that we were going to be attacked with missiles and the missiles would be tipped with chemical weapons. So we had these suits that we wore, um, full-body suits, and you had a, 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 a syringe which you were meant to plunge into your leg in the event that nerve gas was used because it might rescue you. And it was all... I mean, you, obviously it wasn't going to work. Nothing would have worked. We couldn't have put the suits on because we weren't properly trained. It was, soldiers can do it because they, they're used to doing it, but just hopeless journalists, we would, <laughs> we'd just, we would all have died. And that you had that constant feeling in the back of your mind that if a missile with chemical weapons was fired at Dharan, where we were in Saudi Arabia, then we would all be be killed and it would be it would be really horrible so you know you you have those those immediate things where you think goodness i'm in real danger now and you have those that sort of wider sense that you put yourself into a into a conflict zone but um yeah it's uh, it's very character building and you discover really early on in your life whether that's for you or whether it isn't you spent your whole career with the bbc do you think working for them has prevented you from asking what you see as the important mm -hmm. questions that's a very good question. I think it prevents you, working for the BBC prevents you from um, developing yourself as an opinionated uh, mover, shaper of the world because the BBC is always on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, on the other hand, in a BBC way, maybe you're better at doing your job if you are thinking in those terms. I think the big danger of working for the BBC is that you see two sides of everything, including a thing where actually one side is plainly right and one side is plainly wrong, in, in the sense of true and false. Um, so and I, I think, broadly, working for the BBC frees you up because there aren't commercial pressures, because there aren't the pressures of a proprietor, like a newspaper proprietor, who wants you to go in one direction, because those pressures don't exist. There are other pressures, but not those ones. It actually frees you up to be more honest than you can otherwise be. So although you're a little bit constrained, I can't go off and tell you what I really think about Donald Trump or Barack Obama or anything, or, 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 um, uh, or something about British politics where I work at the moment. But on the other hand, I'm free to be able to say what I think is the truth about what Trump has done or Obama did or, or whatever. And that, in, in a sense, is a, is a more freeing thing, I think. So I think, on balance, the answer to your question is actually no, I don't think I've been constrained at all uh, working for the BBC. And I don't think that is the case, would be the case, with someone joining the BBC now and, and looking at the next 20, 30 years. You've criticised them for being anti-American. Mm. Do you see any other biases? Oh, we're all riven with biases, aren't we? And the, the BBC is an organisation that has enormous strengths, but almost because of the way it's funded, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's not a tax, but the licence fee that takes money from everyone in Britain who's got a television means that the BBC has a stream of income 
that another commercial organisation would die for, just don't have. Mm -hmm. And that allows the BBC to be a little bit uh, naive about commercial things, a little bit snooty about the need to make money and the importance of making money and the uh, uh, so there's a slight, it's not a left-wing bias, I, I don't agree with those who say the BBC is left-wing, but it's a sort of public sector bias, if I could put it like that. The BBC has a bias towards actually organisations like the United Nations, like big multinational organisations, like the European Union actually, there is this kind of sense that all these things are a good thing in the BBC, because we are a similar organisation, you know, funded the funding of the organisation is not something you think about daily when you're doing it. And in many respects, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I think it's, I think it's a great thing for the BBC. And it's a great thing for audiences of the BBC that it's developed in that way. But then that does make the organisation also um, uh, less receptive than others might be to the realities of the commercial marketplace and perhaps less knowledgeable about them. So at, at that level, I think the BBC does have... Um, biases and difficulties that always need to be addressed. Um, but but I, think, I, I think there are few of them uh, and they're capable with and I think there are enough people inside the BBC, as with America, when I suggested to the BBC that actually we, we didn't really understand America properly or make the effort to. They just said to me, rather than saying, OK, you're fired, they said, well, go on, you know, do, do it then. Uh, so it's an open organisation, which I, th I think, again, is, is one of the BBC's great strengths. Trump has called freedom of press disgusting. Do you think his <laughs> aggressive criticisms of the bias and fake news media pose a real threat to free press in the US? Yeah, I, think, I, not, I don't think he personally poses the threat, but I think his supporters pose a threat. And it's not a threat uh, that they directly pose themselves as individuals, but it's the threat that people genuinely no longer accept that anything is a fact on either side of an argument. Um, and you see this with particularly with the case of Roy Moore, the senator or the Senate candidate in um, Alabama, who's been accused of all sorts of um, sexual abuse of, of kids and, and just a whole litany of things. And, and what's really interesting to me is not whether it's true or false, I know it's true or false, but his supporters say it's false <laughs> and his opponents say it's true. And you think, well, that shouldn't really be the case. You, you should be able to, to, to decide whether things are true or false, not on the basis of whether you support someone or oppose them, but on the basis of what actually is the case. And I think the big risk for America is that right across the piece, in, in a whole lot of areas, people will no longer accept that there is anything that is true and false other than what you want to believe. And that, that is very dangerous, because it's dangerous to the media, because then what's the point of the media in a way? But it's also dangerous to people as individuals. It's dangerous to democracy, because if you don't accept that there are some things that are actually true, whether or not you want them to be, and some things that are actually false, whether or not you want them to be, then you're not able to make wise decisions, informed decisions about life. And that then undermines everything. So, yeah, I don't think Trump necessarily as an individual is a big threat, but I think Trumpism, I think, I think that idea that you don't accept anything as true and false, I think that, that is a threat, yeah. And what do you think the role of the press should be in the Trump era? I think the role of the President Trump era has to be to persuade people that they mustn't make up their minds on the basis of whether or not they support an individual or a candidate or, or a way of thinking. Um, so it's, it's a matter of plugging away and making sure that they don't get sucked into being on one side or the other. And for a lot of the American media that's impossible because they are as they are, they're structured as they are and they're funded as they are. But there are enough people there, decent people working in organisations that can make choices about what they say and do that I think they'll, they'll survive it, but it's going to be difficult. Do you think in the age of social media and with increasing access to information, people are more vulnerable to being misled? Or do you think the public will become more discerning? Well, at the moment, uh, I think the more vulnerable, I think we're all more vulnerable. Um, it's such a quick process, isn't it? You see something, just a couple of sentences, it reinforces what you already think, maybe. And that's a big psychological 
issue, confirmation bias, which psychologists have known about for an awful lot of time. We're, we're more likely to believe something that we already half think uh, than something that challenges us. Um, so what do we do about that? As you suggest, is one possibility. Perhaps eventually we become more discerning. We just don't believe any of it. Is that an option? Uh, I suppose it, it partially is. Well, that makes us rather reduced as people, I think, because we just, we just go back into our shells. Do we become more discerning in a way that allows us to believe some of it and not other stuff? Uh, possibly. I think I, I do, what I do think is that I think we've reached a stage at the moment where with social media, where it's such an early stage of it, we're still really struggling to cope with the amount of information and the amount of rubbish and, and sort it all out in our minds. I think eventually, actually, we will get better at it. I'm quite optimistic in a way. I think I'm probably quite optimistic about it. I think a lot of people will begin to realise that most of it is rubbish and put it to one side. But it's, it's a job of work that we all have to take part in. Finally, what advice would you give young people interested in pursuing journalism as a career? Uh, my advice would be um, two things, actually. Number one, uh, don't worry about the money, because although I've suggested that it's quite difficult to make money as a journalist now, um, uh, because particularly in newspapers, it's very difficult to see how they're going to uh, pay their way in the future. Um, I, I think, put that on one side, if you really enjoy doing it, if you like writing, if you're interested in people, if you want to meet people, if you want to, to convey things, um, if you like doing all that, there is always going to be a need for it to happen. I don't know how it's going to be paid for. I don't know whether the BBC will last the course. Uh, I don't know whether newspapers will. But I do know that there's just no question at all that people will need and have a desire to have well-written, interesting things um, that aren't just opinion and kind of rubbish. So uh, I'd, I'd be quite, quite positive about it, actually. I think it's a, it's a decent thing to do. It's an enormously enjoyable thing to do. And uh, it beats uh, working in a bank. Mm -hmm.